In a recent Medscape survey, urologists were found to be among those who are most burned out in their specialties in, practice, in the practice of medicine. Part of that burnout is because we are doing so many things that are not related to the care of patients, such as clinical documentation and just busy work. The, the, the type of work that doesn't take care of patients, but we have to do it because of the bureaucracy when it comes to medicine. My guest today, Kelly Kasperson, she's a urologist practicing in Washington. She has been using a virtual scribe, a virtual assistant, who kind of helps her in her day-to-day -day clinical practice. And I'm very interested to find out how she's utilizing this person and how is she so happy practicing. And not only that, she's extremely productive. She's the second most productive urologist in her four-person practice, if I'm not mistaken. So welcome to the program, Kelly, and thank you so much for letting me interview you. Thanks, Dr. Lin. I'm happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about your foray into virtual assistants. Sure. So last, last fall, we had a, some turnover in our MA staffing. And so we were going to have people that needed to be retrained. And I kind of was looking for a solution to a problem that we had. And, and the problem was needing to retrain people and teaching them how to enter into our EMR. And I have a friend who's a urologist in Boulder who I know used HelloRache and had been using it for a, over a year. And so I trusted it was somebody who had the workflow of similar to me with the product that was working for her. So I reached out and got a virtual assistant. And I've had the same assistant now for at least four months. He knows my workflow completely. All of my chart notes are done by the end of the day. I go home with, with a completely empty inbox and I, I'll never practice without a, a scribe again. Wow, that's amazing. So you, if this came out of necessity, you were missing a staff person and you didn't really want to have to hire someone in real life, vet the person. Instead, you turned to a company called Hello Raish, and they actually have vetted a bunch of virtual assistants. Uh, they're generally out of the country, right, in the Philippines. However, Hello Raish is based in Arizona. Yeah, so it's an American company with international employees. And the nice thing about it is that they're, this is their job. They want to be scribes. It's actually a good job for them. And so I've been able to have the same person this whole time. And th that's another reason why I didn't want to get an American scribe is because usually they're pre-med students or they're people who are looking to move up within healthcare. And I didn't want to just have to keep retraining people to my workflow all the time, which is what you do when you have a, a in-person scribe. So I love that it's consistent. It's the same guy we've bonded. Um, we actually have the same birthday. No way. <laughs> so, so I don't think same year, but the same day. And uh, we're trying to figure out how to get a cake over to him in May. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so <clears throat> your your friend in Colorado uh, gave you the Hello Rage's information. You call Hello Rage. Take us back. How did all that start? How did you ramp up and, and the uh, onboarding process? Yeah, so the there's a an, an American person who's kind of the manager. And so he said, what's your workflow like? How many hours do you need? And he sent me two applicants and they kind of give you a video of them and they kind of tell you about them. And in that way, you can understand their English. You can kind of get to know them just by video interview. And I said, well, let's pick this person. Um, and then you have to give them 30 hours a week in order to have the same person. That's just that contract. So he actually does some behind the scenes you know, EMR filtering stuff that when I'm not in clinic, because I'm not seeing patients in clinic 30 hours a week. When I'm in the OR, he's not with me. So we're able to give him the 30 hours he needs so that I can have the same person and he has a full-time job. Okay. What was the onboarding process like? You call the company and they, they send you two resumes, you picked one, but then what about all the other stuff like the, the, BAA, Business Associates Agreement, and, and yep. the technology behind yep. it. How so the, involved the is that? The company's completely HIPAA, HIPAA certified, so they already have that behind them. We got them a login to our EMR. Um, I downloaded, the, so they use, um, it's called Blue Jeans, which is pretty much like Zoom, but so it's our video, and it's literally, we have like a, you know, how you Zoom have a meeting. We have a Blue like, Jeans account. You like what we're on a, right now. We're on Zoom. Yeah. So I basically just hit join every morning, flip my screen open and he can see me and we say, hey, good morning to each other. Um, the, I, I was pretty guarded for a, a good month. 
I knew it was going to take a while to say, hey, what can he do for me? And, you know, is the, is the English as a second language going to be okay? Is that going to flow okay? Um, and he, we actually have a thing where he can see my screen. So I can be like, hey, I want you to, you know, this is how I order this. And so he can watch me do it. So that's really nice for training. Oh, like screen share. Yep. Neat. Yep. How long did that so, take? I, I, I kind of gave it a, a month before I was willing to judge if it was going to work for me or not. And by a month, it's flowing. And, and now he, so, I mean, for example, it's, you know, a patient's coming in for Botox not working, right? So he knows that and his plan is 76 year old Botox not working. And then he has my inner stim template already put in there. Like he knows I'm going to talk about inner stim when Botox isn't working. So I'm like, this guy knows my urology now. Got it. It's, it's insane. I'll, <laughs> I'll never be without a scribe again. And the other thing is I never realized how much data entry I was doing as far as this. Yes. And now that I, now that I don't do it of like a CAT scan result you know, putting it all in and I don't do it anymore. I don't type in a physical exam anymore. I just say what the physical exam is. And we have dictation things on our phones. So, and I still have that for when I, when he's not there, or if it's something super complicated, I'll be like, let me just dictate this out. Um, but it's faster than logging onto my app on my phone and dictating and having it sync. So which it's e fantastic. Which EHR are you using? Um, for centricity, GE centricity. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So you're able to find this person um, between the two applicants that were sent to you, and then you set up some sort of a HIPAA compliant connection with that person uh, out of the country, and that mm -hmm. person is vetted, and you're mm -hmm. operating through a, through a company that has gone through the HIPAA compliance. And believe it or not, these VAs go through a HIPAA training. Yep. Yeah. So then you have this person shadow you for about a month or so, kind mm -hmm. of watching your workflow? Yeah, and, and truthfully, it's probably faster than a month. I mean, he's doing stuff from day one, but I'd say for him to learn my flow, learn how, and it, what's funny is, so I'll dictate like results reviewed from Dr. Peterson or something, and I'll spell out the doctor's names because it's an American you know, name. And the other day he's like, doc, I don't need you to spell the names anymore. I got them all. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm like, amazing. Okay, you're gonna have, I'm gonna have to untrain that I spell these doctors' names to you, but let me know when you need something spelled. <laughs> wow. He's amazing. And my nurses love him. Like he's just part of the clinic. How does how does this person follow you into the exam room? Or does this person follow you in the exam room? And does this person see the patient at all? Or how does or does this person just face you in front of your computer? So he's just on my computer and he sees me. Um, our, our, our exam rooms are decently big and, you know, urology, there's no carpet. So, so they're kind of yeah. echoey. Um, and so he was, he has trouble kind of hearing a person in the room. So I'll summarize though. And I have to tell you my patients, like they love it. Once they figure, they don't all understand. Even if I say there's a scribe here, they don't get it, but I'll say, let me summarize this and I'll summarize the plan. And I look at the patient and I say, does that sound like what our plan is? And I think they actually love that. I just summarized it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're you're summarizing for your scribe, but then the patient is also hearing it. At my former practice, there was no voice recognition. It was a digital recorder that I had in the room, and I would dictate the entire HMP in front of the patient. And so, mm -hmm. if there are any mistakes, I would just make an addendum, and the transcriptionist would make the change. So, in a similar vein, you have somebody virtually in a room with you and doing a lot of that work. Yeah, yeah, and so he doesn't see the patient. He doesn't see the patient when they're undressed. You know, I kind of just put my computer in and turn it. And then I, I always leave the room for the patient to get redressed, and then that's when I dictate my note. And so, you know, it's a templated physical exam, so it's, it's pretty quick. I'll just be like, normal, including auscultation, mild vaginal atrophy, no prolapse. Got it. Does... So it's, it's pretty fast. It's way faster than me going click, 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 click. So does the person even talk to there's a does a scribe talk to you or VA talk to you during the day or is he kind of just quiet in the background no we're back and forth because I'll be like hey Anton I, I you know I'll let you and I can I can silence it so like if I'm talking with a partner or something I can just silence it so he can't hear what I'm seeing and I can flip my thing so he can't see and I'll be like hey Anton looks like there's going to be five minutes before this next person comes in and so like I'll I'll give him breaks and he takes a break when I take a lunch 
Um, so no, we, I mean, we talk a lot, but it's, it's friendly. It's friendly talk. Like, I'm just wondering if that conversation, uh, can be heard in the exam room with the patient. Oh, or you don't um, talk to him. No, he, he doesn't really talk, but he, he'll verbalize that he, get, he got my order. Cause I'll be got like it. renal ultrasound diagnosis, recurrent UTI and put in estrace cream. And he'll be like, got it doc. So and, like he'll verbally. So I know that that happened. Got it. Yeah. I understood. All right. And, and the patients are okay with it. Yeah, I think, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think a lot of patients are very used to people having scribes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I also presented of like, I have a scribe to help me with all of the paperwork so I can look you in the eye and listen to you. Yeah, I think patients uh, really appreciate that, especially nowadays. Yeah, and nobody's been like, you shouldn't have that or please. Nobody's told me to turn it off. Like, I think it's people. I think patients understand that doctors have a lot of that going on. And I mean, most of them are blown away. They're like, wow, you have help. That's so amazing. Like, oh, that's great. So the retail cost, everybody's probably going to be wondering how much does it cost. And retail cost, I believe, is $9 an hour. $9 an hour, plus about, uh, I think, 140 a year for blue jeans. Wow. I don't know if I can handle that. <laughs> so you, you see, one, see, see one new patient a day. I mean, easily, yeah. like... I have more time in my day now. Yeah. And that just, that it just suddenly, the time just suddenly appeared because I'm not doing this. And you're not doing the manual data entry, which, I mean, talk about the most expensive data entry person in the world, right? Physicians, yeah. especially urologists. I mean, we go through college, four years of med school, five or six years of training after that. And what do we do? We spend a lot of our time data entry. Yeah. And I mean, I was pretty good. I did not have many open charts before I had a scribe just because I, I forget who people are. I see, you know, 10 new recurrent UTIs a day. I, I have to chart and close my charts because I forget who they are. Me too. Um, but now I always have my charts closed and I have, I have time. Like I have time during my day. I'm like starting a podcast for Christ's sake. I have so much yeah, time. I was gonna, yeah, I was going to, I was going to say, we were going to plug that real quick. You right. started with, with the virtual assistant, you now started a passion project, right? Yeah. It's a yeah. podcast called You Are Not Broken. And where can people find this podcast? You can find it on Spotify. You can find it on Apple iTunes. That's the biggest one. Apple iTunes. Uh, Anchor is the free platform that I use. And that just got bought by Spotify. So Spotify and, and Apple are the two big ones, but it's on like eight platforms. Yeah, because of the VA, you now are able to pursue this passion project where you talk about female sexual function, dysfunction. Yeah, we talk about pelvic health and sex and- Orgasms. Orgasms and relearning all the stupid things that society told you. Yeah, the, all the <laughs> all the falsehoods that, that movies yeah. have taught us. like All the lies. Yeah, exactly. And like, you should be like ready to go. Spontaneous desire is the only thing that happens. Instead right. You of should reactive. have spontaneous desire in a long-term relationship and not use lube and <laughs> or have simultaneous orgasms. Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, here, here, share, share it's with all wrong. Share with us one tidbit. Let's go off script here. Share with us one tidbit about female orgasms, such as okay, what? How many women actually orgasm with penile vaginal sex? It depends upon which study you read, but basically around 15%. Exactly. And, and the theory is for the women that do orgasm with penis and vagina sex, their clitoral to vaginal length is shorter. Yeah, because of the, 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 the movement, actually, the, the, the stimulation is, is much more intense. Yep. And then there's, yeah. the, you know, there's the, the, the clitoral orgasm, and then there's the G-spot orgasm, and then the, there's that combination combined orgasm. Yeah. It depends on who you talk to. Some people are, I gave this talk, I gave this talk in my office with a sex therapist and she's like, I'm going to tell the women about the 13 different ways to orgasm. And I'm like, no, they just want to have one orgasm right now. Like, let's not give them like, you know, start at the very beginning. To like, yeah. I'm so, I want to have one and there's 13 I'm not having. <laughs> so I was like, let's not tell them about all the 13. Let's get them to one. Yeah. <laughs> so, we can have a, we can have a master class after yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> That'll take the whole weekend. Uh, I'll take all weekend. So, so the virtual assistant literally freed up enough time so that you can pursue something that you you enjoy. Like you know, when they say when you find your passion and you work towards that passion, it's not really work. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's like 
you know, and I've, I've told other people this of like, I actually don't want to see just sexual dysfunction in my clinic all day. Like I love being a general urologist that sees everything. And so this is my outlet to be like, it's not on my work website. It's not like even involved in my work at all. Cause I'm like, I, I can't educate the world 10 patients a day. Like the nation needs to hear this. Yes. This is so many people and so many women and so many relationships. And I just got to the point where I'm like, I'm never going to do it just by seeing people one-on-one. -on -one. And I think that's why doctors end up going into public health or they end up going into outreach because they're like, I see a big problem that I can't, I can't do it much about it just by being a, a urologist in a clinic. So that's kind of where that came from. So thankfully it's, it's, we have social media and free platforms. And I, I watch a lot of your, uh, your not broken content on YouTube, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So I listened, I, mean, I listened to, it, I listened to your YouTube. It's an insane time to be living in where it's like, I have a podcast that's free besides the fact that I bought a microphone. YouTube's free. Facebook's free. And it's like people, this is where people are getting their information. And Lord knows there's enough bad medical education out there. Oh my gosh, there so much bad that, stuff. So much bad stuff, but it's like, it doesn't, you know, we don't have to have a network contract anymore. Like this is free stuff. So I'll, you know, I'll probably buy fancier microphones. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> your, your, your show mic sounded pretty good. Yeah, your show mic <laughs> sounded, it's definitely good. It's so, my intro mic. But yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no barrier to entry anymore. You don't need a recording studio. You don't need, you know, a big video guy. And so it's like, what, a, what an amazing opportunity to be a physician to help educate the world. And but that is predicated on a physician who is not so bogged down by the minutia, the documentation requirements, so that he or she can bill the the work that that's been performed, so that you yeah, can be so paid I was, adequately. I was like, I was DMing with a friend last night on Facebook who is a gynecologist, and she was like, "Can I ask you about a patient?" And I'm like, "No, I'm going to bed." And she's like, "Oh, I'm still up doing charts." Oh my and gosh. I'm like, and I'm like, this is super timely for our conversation today because I knew we were going to meet today to talk about it. It's like that doctor is doing charts at 10 p.m. Like that's not good for your stress. It's not good for your sex life. It's not good for sleep. You know, it, it's, it's just not good for you. You never get away from work. It is not, and, it is not uncommon. It is so pervasive, especially I, I think all fields. I hear it. You, you and I share a lot of uh, common Facebook groups. So you, you see the same gripes people complaining about how they're still documenting, they have to take the work, their work home. Um, yeah. You and I have figured out that, oh, 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 you know, my, I don't use a VA, but you do. We figured out a way so that we can maximize our workflow in the office and you by using a virtual assistant and I use a very optimized workflow and voice recognition to finish my work on time. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think as far as burnout goes, leaving your work at work for doctors, for anybody, leaving your work at work and then being able to have your family at home and your home at home is studies. We know that that's good for preventing burnout. And if you're taking home or you're just thinking like I have a hundred charts, and I don't even remember who these people are. Yeah. Like it's not, it's not good for you. Yeah. I, I, I'm like you, I can't remember everybody because just this morning, I, th I think I saw 11 new patients. I can't remember all the details. If I saw two or three scrotal pains at a time, I can't remember, well, does this person's scrotal pain be began five days ago? Or is right. this the guy who start whose scrotal pain started two days ago? So I yeah. try to, I try, I try to finish my charts, like all the morning patients, I'll finish the charts, like probably half the charts in the morning and then half during lunch. So they're all done. And then I start fresh in the afternoon. And by the end yeah. of the day, all my charts are done. So my staff knows if anybody looks up that patient, if the patient would have called back early, then we have all the information, my thinking process and everything. The other thing that I do a lot is repetition, right? And I just, I have a lot of repetition in my day and the fact that I don't have to be doing this. So I probably give like 10 estrogen cream prescriptions on a given day. Like I've given everybody in my county estrogen cream at this point. <laughs> and, and then a whole, I get a whole new clinic and they all need estrogen cream. I'm like, I'm not making a difference. So I have not physically put in an estrogen cream prescription in four months. I just say, I give her estrogen cream and he knows exactly what I want. He knows how many refills I do for standard. He does it all. And I'm like, oh my God, I get to be a doctor. I just get to say you need estrogen cream. And then it just goes to your pharmacy. Yeah. It's, um, it's amazing. That's awesome. The, the, how, do you, I, how do you handle uh, control substances? 
I guess you. I still hand. Yeah, I still handwrite that. Oh, okay. So, and I don't think we can do that anymore in Arizona. In Washington, you you still can. You don't handwrite. I haven't. I haven't handwritten a. a oh, they're electronic there. Yeah, I've they, been they doing. should be electronic That's... for for a long time. Yeah, I think Washington's headed there, but they're not there yet. Sounds good. So, any any uh, downsides that you notice with having a VA? It's personal. Like he, he knows me because my patient, at least my patients, like they ask me. They want to know about my kids. They want to know, like, oh, that's it. the relationship I have with my patients. So yes. I'm like, my scribe, number one, I talk about sex a lot. <laughs> number two, like, he's probably like, oh, her kid had the flu this weekend. Like, he, he knows all those things. And, you know, it's like, oh, this is a stranger in the Philippines who knows a lot about me. And that, that can give me a, I'm a very personal, you know, private person. So I'm like, it, I could see how some people might not like that. Sure. Truthfully, I'm like, he's vetted. The company knows where he is. He seems really nice. <laughs> but if I ever go missing, <laughs> call Hello Ray. We know Anton. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that, I mean, that's, that's one thing, I guess, is maybe it's too personal for some person because I'm like, he's in there listening to intimate conversations with me all day long. But to me, it's worth it. Yeah, same same with me. Initially, when I first started practice, I wouldn't share a lot of my personal information with the patients. But now I realize if people want to find out something, if they want it bad enough, they, they can find it. And look at our cell phones, and they're constantly listening to us when you say whatever the command is for Siri, whatever the command is for Android. I'm not, I'm not going to say it because my phone's going to turn on. <laughs> It's it's constantly listening to us. The, right. any, any, do we use a browser? Anybody who has a smartphone who uses uh, Chrome or Internet Explorer or Safari, the cookies are there. They're tracking they you. Yeah. They know yeah. where you are by GPS. Even when you have the phone off, it still knows where you are. That's been yeah. proven. And, and people yeah, are worse. And, and I think society thinks it's worth the trade off, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. And I think that's the same about the scribe. People will always favor convenience over privacy. I think this privacy thing is so overblown in our next generation, maybe in future, the next generation, I think that's all going to be like, oh, I can't believe these early internet people are so worried about their privacy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I just remember, I don't know if you remember, I did an interview with a guy who just with a few pieces of information, he can it's it's kind of like minority report except for your prospective patient. Did you did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. So just just for with minimal amount of information, he can pull, he can query the database from all fifty states and then give you a risk score for for that patient relative to your exposure to litigation. That's insane. Right. And patient then, profiling. I know That's patient profile. That's exactly right. Patient profile. I mean, the, the patients potential patients profile us all the time. So. Anyway, that's, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, and the thing, you know, we worry about all this HIPAA stuff and, and it's, it's curious to me, but it's like, we know Amazon has all this info. We know Google has all this info and it's all medical info. So like, why are the doc, to me, it's goofy. I'm like, you realize how much health information is out there in these companies. And why are we picking on the like small dentistry group for like, you know, to me, it's, it seems hypocritical. It's like, do the best you can, but hospitals have been selling your medical information for years it's it's out there yeah and then also the the internal the uh, american board of internal medicine and the the certification bodies for a lot of these specialty groups i mean i think when you sign up to credential or go through moc for abim they have you sign this waiver so they they're selling these physicians information about their score about their demographics i mean they have everything social security number they have everything mm -hmm. yeah yeah so it's crazy so privacy uh, this person who's following you around eight hours a day while you're seeing patients while you share intimate information with your patients about yourself now this third party in the philippines now has or knows about you which is yep. you know for some people may not sit too well mm -hmm. yeah but to me i'm like it's completely worth the trade-off like yeah, the freedom you have and, and the, the fact that you, you can really, really enjoy the practice of medicine instead of having to worry about yeah, and, documentation. Yeah, and the virtual scribes, I mean, I, I, dollar for dollar, you cannot beat oh my the gosh. price compared to having a, an American human in your 
I mean, the price is, it's insane. And, and physician burnout, we know how expensive physician burnout is and how expensive it is to rehire a new physician. You know, I've employed friends who are like, oh, my, my hospital would never let me have a scribe or they'd say I have to pay for a scribe or something. But I'm like, you can't, you can't afford not to as far as, you know, happiness and see one more patient a day and you've paid for it. Yeah. So to me, I'm like, it's completely worth it. The learning curve is a little painful, but we've learned harder things than this. Like, this is not the hardest thing you've ever learned. And, so, and, and I'm sure Hello Rage has been, uh, has done this quite a few times to really onboard physicians in in a very rapid fashion now. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've been completely professional. They're one, we're not, they're not learning how to do this with us. <laughs> they already know yeah, what they're doing. Yeah, they've done it. They've done it many, many times. And, and for those who are watching and wondering, we are not sponsored. This video is not sponsored by Hello mm -hmm. Ratio or anybody. We're not being paid by them. Uh, Callie just been using them for a while. And I figured, you know, part of the reason I do what I do is kind of like what you said, you, you want to do something and you want to spread the word. I kind of don't want physicians to burn out. I especially do not want urologists to burn out. Part of the reason is I'm a little selfish, right? I'm getting older. I may need urologic services. My dad needed a TURP for his enlarged prostate. As I get older, I can't have all of you burn out and quit. I need to I need you to keep working. Number one, I need you to continue to contribute to the taxes, right? The government theft. And number two, I may need your services. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, once you find happiness, you just, you want it for everybody else. And, and you want to be like, urology is amazing. It's the crap that you have to do that's not amazing. And just like, and, you know, for all physicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. all the, the, the prior auth, the step therapy, um, and the the uh, peer to peer when you're not really to talking to your peer. Yeah. Right? The, the, yeah. the stuff that we have to jump to, and then the clinical documentation just to satisfy some bean counters so we can be paid for the work totally. that we do. I mean, I'm looking forward to 2021 and dropping the, you know, components just back to medical decision making. So I'm like, I'm not going to have to deal with family history, which is most of the time irrelevant and social history, which is most of the time irrelevant, except for the pertinent stuff that you're going to put in the HPI and you know review of systems so i think you know in that way if you're not going to get a scribe like your documentation is going down just know that it's going down i, I was just talking to somebody who had no idea it was coming and it's oh, like if you don't know that that if you don't know that that's coming you're going to miss out on the opportunity to chart less <laughs> and now that, that oh my gosh yeah the, the medical decision making is is um anyway for those who are who are not aware when it comes to evaluation and management billing and documentation in January 1st, 2021, that is changing. This is coming from the American Medical Association. They are the folks who make the CPT codes. They're re revamping evaluation and management documentation requirements. History section, physical examination are no longer gonna be needed. It's gonna be as clinically, you will document as clinically necessary, but it's not going to count when it comes to coming up with a code and this, just talking about this, I mean, how stupid, how crazy it is that, that we have to understand coding and, and documentation requirements for, for anyway, and that's just part of the insanity. That's just part of the insanity. Do you think, do you think that private insurers are going to jump on immediately or we're going to have to code different for different insurers start January 2nd, 2021? It's going to be, it, it's coming from, this is not a Medicare rule. This is com actually coming from it's the not AMA. not a Medicare rule. Okay. This is coming so from the be, AMA. it should be all insurances. Though. Yes. Now, that awesome. is, they're supposed to, just like insurances are supposed to follow NCCI, NC, National Code, Correct Coding Initiative, Initiative Guidelines, and some of them don't. They make up their own rules. But this E&M change is coming from the AMA. So it's everybody. It's that's good. That's helpful. Supposed to I was be. Like, am I going to have to care about the review of systems for <clears throat> Blue Cross? Yeah. Hopefully not. Yeah. Well, the, I remember uh, being a medical student and being like, does nobody else think a review of systems is completely stupid? Is it just me? <laughs> and now that it's going away, I'm like, ah, oh, other people thought that this was a problem. They did something about it. Thank you, people. Yeah. It, <laughs> uh, however, medical decision making is changing. So that is going to be. It is changing. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I, I just started uh, digging into it. Uh, last night, while was, I was waiting for one of my kids' football flag football practices, I was in my car looking through that. How crazy is that? 
Yeah. Uh, but anyway, having that virtual assistant allows you to uh, free up your time so you can enjoy what you do, what you do, and also uh, pursue your passion project. So it's it's a good thing. It sounds like it's a really really uh, good idea, and it doesn't seem like it costs a lot when it comes to dollars. Yeah, exactly. And if we, I can, don't like, I don't like spending money yeah. on frivolous things. Yeah, so and, and if it, we can, if we can save one physician from burning out, I think that's that's well worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Any other suggestions for those uh, who are thinking about uh, using a virtual scribe? I, I mean, there's, there's truthfully, there's nothing to lose. Give yourself, give yourself a couple of weeks to learn it. Um, but like time will magically appear in your day because you're not doing this. Then that was what was so amazing. It's like, oh my gosh, I've got another, I've got another 10 minutes with no patience here. Yeah. <laughs> so, then what do I, it, no, no, then what do you do? Well, you get on urologists on social media, Facebook page. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, or you get on, you get on this page uh, th that we're, we're uh, broadcasting on the uh, Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group. And then you respond to questions other people in other practices who are not so fortunate uh, to have such an efficient f workflow. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to be in Sufu in Phoenix in two weeks. Um, so I hope to see you there. But if anybody is going and wants to talk about scribes or, you know, anything else. Well, I put uh, your, I put your uh, podcast, You're Not Broken, in the uh, video description. And I also put cool. the link to your practice in the video description. And I'll put, also put the link to Hello Rache in the video description. Um, Stephanie says hello. And Jeffrey and Danielle, thank you so much for watching so late in the evening. Cool. Um, if you have any questions, obviously leave them in the, in the comments below. And I'm sure um, Kelly or myself will try to respond in a timely fashion. So thank you all so much for, for watching. And thank you so much, Kelly, for doing this so late at night. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. See you in a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.